Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, what I have here is a small demonstration. I was hoping that the projector would work, but we'll try to do it with a camera with the help of your uh, uh, classmates. So here I have uh, canola oil inside uh, semolina seeds. And uh, uh, as I just uh, shake the mix, uh, the seeds are uh, almost randomly distributed and I place them right here. So you see the seeds that they are almost uh, randomly uh, distributed there. I have connected uh, two electrodes. Uh, the, uh, el the, the, what you see over there looks pretty much like the capacitor that we did yesterday. And uh, I have uh, connected two uh, electrodes to a voltage source. Uh, it is uh, a total of about 8 kilovolts and uh, what you see happening is that uh, those seeds are uh, now from the random position that they started from they are reorienting themselves uh, along straight lines or almost straight lines obviously this is uh, the real thing so there are many um, you know uh, limitations to this experiment but you do see that outside there is this random distribution of the seeds and then inside this uh, alignment along the electric force. The electric forces are hidden many times uh, the uh, obstacle, the intellectual obstacle with this course is that we don't see electric fields as much as we see let's say gravity. Uh, I can let a chalk fall on the ground and I demonstrate the existence of gravitational force. That is because electric forces are really hidden in nature. They are so powerful that you need to have electric neutrality for matter to exist and therefore we cannot observe them that easily. However, we can create topologies like this and you see now little by little the formation of those uh, uh, straight lines. And uh, in fact, we will see later on that always the electric field remains perpendicular to conductors. Whenever you have a conductor, the electric field lines will be perpendicular. This is exactly what you see. And uh, you can rest for a bit until I change the electrode. I can repeat the experiment with a different set of electrodes now. A little bit more Fancy, so something like this, uh, you will see it when I put it back on camera. So I shake the mix again. So you can still uh, again see that it, that uh, it is randomly distributed. Maybe what we can do is focus as well. Can we focus? Okay, that's even better. All right. So now I turn on the voltage. Uh, maybe now we lost the resolution. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit easier to show this on the uh, projector. But you may be seeing now those straight lines being forming with those particles hitting uh, the conductors again at straight lines. Uh, so uh, this is a sort of a cutout coaxial. Uh, the coaxial has an inner cylinder and outer cylinder. Here the outer cylinder has been uh, cut out. And uh, well, with uh, the, I guess uh, you see it better so you can <laughs> affirm that this happens that uh, you have this reorientation of the charged particles along the lines. It's a bit uh, difficult to hit the right resolution. Maybe this one shows it a bit better. Yeah. So you see from the random cloud that uh, we started from, now we have those uh, lines that connect the two conductors. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your help. Yeah, the, he deserves uh, the, the applause. Uh, <laughs> he don't need to hear. <laughs> All right. So that was this. Let me remove the cables from my way. 
so that I don't uh, trip. I always uh, like making my uh, lectures entertaining, but not that ent entertaining that I would trip uh, right on the front. Okay, so I'm uh, continuing with Gauss's law today. Uh, let me remind you, Gauss's law is one of the two laws satisfied by the electric field. See? Yeah, It involves an arbitrary closed surface No assumptions made. Uh, so this now encloses a volume uh, V. So volume V is enclosed. Uh, you can uh, calculate an integral of the electric field. Uh, let me state the law and then we'll go to your question. An integral of the electric field by discretizing the surface with differentially Differential surface elements ds, those point out of the surface. And Gauss's law says that if you take this closed integral of the electric field, and here we have a dot product with ds, so you repeat this segmentation of the surface into differentially small elements throughout the surface. So the whole surface is uh, discretized like that. What you will find is the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. Again, let me remind you, I state these laws in free space. Uh, and uh, I'm staying in free space I'll, I'll, until uh, I switch to uh, materials. Uh, so for now, we are really considering that everything here is in free space. You had a question, please. Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, is that better? All right. Um, so some notes here on the Gauss's law. First of all, I should emphasize, and this is what is remarkable, the closed surface S is an arbitrary surface. There is no assumption being made. Always when you run this process, you will find the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. So although we will be applying the law mostly on spheres like we did yesterday, or cylinders, or boxes, and so on, this law holds no matter what surface uh, you choose. And that is what is really remarkable about this law. Second, I come back to a comment I made yesterday about this dot product that appears here. You see that E dot ds is positive when the electric field points outwards, out of the surface. ds points out of the surface. Okay. So for the dot product of two vectors to be positive, they have to point in the same direction. When they point in opposite directions, then this dot product is negative. So E dot ds is positive when the electric field points outwards. Okay. And E dot ds is negative when the electric field points inwards. Okay, because then those two vectors, ds and electric field, are contradirectional. So what does this remind you of? Yes. Sources and sets. That's right. So you see, when E dot ds is positive, the left hand side is positive, then the right hand side is positive. So the enclosed charge is overall positive. 
So Gauss's law says if this is positive on the whole as integrated on the circuit on uh, the surface, then here you will have positive charges inside. On the other hand, if this is negative, then you will have negative charges inside. So basically this is a restatement of the fundamental observable of electricity, which then became Coulomb's slope, which then became the definition of the electric field, that positive charges are sources of electric flux, of electric field lines, and then negative charges are sinks of electric field lines. You see, if the left-hand side is positive, the right-hand side will be positive, but the right-hand side is actually the enclosed charge. So that is uh, Gauss's law basically uh, restating things that we have seen before in a more formal way. Um, the third uh, note I'd like to make is that uh, If we let this closed surface S tend to some differentially small surface delta S around a point. So I take this limit whereby this uh, surface S, closed surface S, becomes now a differentially small surface around a point x, y, z. So imagine a balloon and I collapse it, I take the uh, air out, and the whole surface collapses to a point. So this is a mathematical limit, but it can be like a thought experiment where you imagine that this collapses there. And then also that this volume that is enclosed, so both the closed surface S and enclosed volume V and let me push the board up so that you see better tend to a, sur a closed surface still delta S and an enclosed volume delta V before I move on, let me say that you can express the charge that is enclosed can be expressed in terms of a volume charge density. So basically you can go to every point like this, every volume like this that has come out of this limiting process and say how much charge is in there. DQ, that's great. DQ. So then DQ divided by delta V is what? This is uh, charge per unit volume. So that is what we called volume charge density, rho sub v at that point. Okay? So I can go at every point, even in the ionosphere, where you have this uh, distribution of electrons that have been uh, removed from gas molecules because of UV radiation, UV absorption. And you can say, okay, at that volume, how much charge do I have? Then I define a charge density equal to that charge divided by the volume. And I call this res rho, rho sub v. So the enclosed charge Q enclosed can be expressed in terms of a volume charge density And you see, with this thought experiment, I can define that volume charge density point by point in Coulomb per meter cubed.
how do I connect the two, the Q enclosed and the volume charge density? This is uh, something that there are many examples in your um, textbook and the homework, the uh, early part of uh, chapter four. So if uh, you are given, let's say that you have a sphere and the sphere has one nanocoulomb per meter cubed, how do you find the total charge in the sphere? Yes. Can you repeat what you said? So if you have that volume charge density, rho sub v, at every point in this volume, how do you find the total charge that is enclosed? So v into d and then. Right, you integrate over the volume. So there is a connection between those two. And the connection simply is that the enclosed charge is equal to a volume integral of this rho v over the entire volume. So then generally, this can go to the right hand side of Gauss's law. But I continue with my thought experiment. So now if we go back to this collapsed volume that has collapsed to a point, I can, this delta S is still a closed surface. Remember, I said that Gauss's law holds for any arbitrary surface. So I can go ahead and apply Gauss's law in that collapsed volume. For this delta S and delta V. What do I get? I have uh, that e dot ds over this small surface is equal to the enclosed charge by epsilon naught, one over epsilon naught times the enclosed charge, which now is dq, as I said over there, which I can say is equal to rho v times delta v. So then Gauss's law for this thought experiment becomes this limit where this delta V and the delta S go to zero. Remember, I collapse those volumes practically to a point. So I'm doing a thought experiment, but I'm also taking a mathematical limit where these two go to zero of this integral e dot ds divided by the volume delta v and that is equal to rho v by epsilon naught. You may not be recognizing it, but this expression is actually what we call divergence of the vector e. It's the divergence of the electric field. This is the formal definition of the divergence of a vector. And to define the divergence, of course, uh, we have formulas on how to compute divergence. That's fine. But the fundamental definition is this. It is flux of a vector through a volume that is shrinking to a point divided by that volume that tends to zero. So this is exactly how we come up with divergence. So this is divergence of the electric field. You will see it also through this del operator equal to rho sub v by epsilon naught. So this is the differential form of Gauss's law which we will use later on because as you know we have a lot of software packages that solve differential equations. So integral equations like this are nice, they carry some good insights into physical phenomena, but we cannot go very far in terms of determining fields out of those equations. So when you run the applet, in the background the applet is solving equations like this, differential equations, because these are the ones that we have a lot of uh, 
software that takes the equation and gives you the solution. So that is what is important here and why we mention this form of the law. And you see now the physical insight of what divergence means. Positive divergence means that, if I go back here, so at this point, at this point where the volume has uh, collapsed, the divergence is positive, or maybe I will do it here, if you see electric field lines coming out of this point. So you have to have charge there to see a positive divergence. And the divergence of V is negative, so you see the same conclusions we had for Gauss's law through this formulation, you see that they are inherited by the divergence. That's what divergence means. Divergence means that if it is positive, you see lines uh, that are coming off the point, and if it is negative, you see lines that are sinking into that point. So divergence is a differential operator. As you see here, it maps a vector to a scalar. So we have a mapping of a vector to scalar. And uh, in Cartesian coordinates, Again, in our age sheet, we give it in all coordinates, but in Cartesian coordinates, it is theta ex by theta x plus theta ey by theta y plus theta ez by theta z. So you take each component separately, you differentiate it with respect to its corresponding coordinate, and you add them up. So you see from the formula itself, that at every point in space that you have an electric field, you can define a divergence. So you can take, for example, the fields that we computed and uh, yesterday between uh, the uh, plates or outside the plates, or the field that we computed uh, for a wire line and compute the divergence of it at every point. Guess how much you will find. So here is a, a trick question. Mathematics aside, how much could you find? Uh, so far we have uh, seen uh, how many fields. We have seen uh, the field of a point charge. Okay, so here is a trick question. Find the divergence here. We have, uh, found, uh, we have uh, found the field of a, a charged line, just like a power line. This field was like this. rho L by 2 pi epsilon naught R. So you see we said the point charge varies as 1 over distance squared. Uh, the line charge density creates a field that varies as 1 over distance. And uh, finally we had the charged plates. the electric field was constant. So rho s by 2 epsilon naught, rho s 0 by 2 epsilon naught, 
z direction depending on whether you were above the plane or below the plane. So here's the question. If I go at point P or point M or point Q, uh, not Q, let's call it L, and calculate the divergence of the electric field, of these electric fields. So you go to your aid sheet and you look at the formula, you apply it, and you take the divergence. How much would you get? For P, M, and L. So you see divergence can be calculated on a point-by-point -point basis, right? You can put X, Y, Z if you look at those. Uh, so how much do you get? You get a positive value right, for all of them. What's that? You get a positive value right, for all of them. Positive value. What do you think? If you take, like, if you're enclosing like the entire ch uh, source, right, then shouldn't it just be zero since they're like negating each other? Okay, so zero because why? Because like you have uh, electric fields going in opposite directions that are like because of the symmetry of the problems or like the situation. No, so here is what I, uh, you have uh, the right answer, but with the wrong justification. Here is what I want you to remember. These equations now, so the integral form is talking about a surface. The differential equations are talking about a point, okay? So if you go here at point M, do you see any charge? The charge is not on M, it's here. So the divergence here will be zero. If you go back to your age sheet, and that's why I'm saying that uh, most of this is not really about the mathematics. I don't need an age sheet to calculate divergence there. I just need to remember Gauss's law that says divergence is equal to the volume charge density. But if I am in the air, what is the volume charge density? It's got to be zero. So right here, I don't have a charge. The charge is here. So the big difference between integral forms of these laws and differential forms is the integral forms are talking about a surface. Then you start thinking, how much charge do I enclose? Okay. But if you go to differential equations, differential equations hold on a point-by-point -point basis. Just Look at the expressions. Many times we read mathematics and we miss uh, from uh, all the volume of the equations the essence. If you look at uh, examples of divergence, you see that it's a function of x, y, z. What does that mean? It means that it holds on a point-by-point -point basis. You can go at every point and find the value. So the question for this point M and this point L is do I have right there any charge? No. The charges are here. Do I have any charge there? No, the charges are there, are here, are on the line, on the power line. You are away from the power line, the charges, the charge density is zero. Same thing here. So all these fields have divergence equal to zero, and you can confirm that mathematically as well. Uh, so this was uh, my uh, third note. Uh, questions up to this point? Yes? So in this case, right, as you were talking about point by point, then the divergence of a point where the, there is no charge will be zero. But what if uh, there is a surface itself where there are some electric field lines going and some electric fields, uh, field lines going out and going in, then won't the, the divergence be then the, like the summation of the... So unless you have charge density, uh, look at the law. Did I? Uh, yes, I did write it. Divergence of V is rho sub V by epsilon naught. Okay? If you want me to make it more explicit, let me put it that way. Divergence of V at x, y, z is 1 over epsilon naught rho V at x, y, z. So the only question is at that x, y, z point where you do the evaluation, do you have charge density or not? So I don't know what scenario you have in mind, maybe a surface or a coaxial cable or whatever, but unless you do this evaluation right on uh, a place where you have charges, then the result will be zero, will have to be zero. Okay. And you know why here it will be zero, physically? Because if you set up a surface or a volume like this, 
just as much flux enters the volume will exit the volume. That is geometrically why this will happen. So the balance of flux, it is like, uh, how should I say, uh, you have a water hose, right? If you go right where the water opens, you see a difference because before you don't have water and then you have water. But then if you go along the water stream and you are holding like a, a bucket that you have removed the bottom, right? As much and the volume that enters is equal to the volume that exits, so you don't collect anything. So that's what happened on these points. Whatever enters, exits, and then the divergence is zero. So this is the physical view of the thing. But also you can simply believe Gauss's law that unless you have a charge there, you don't have any divergence. Okay, okay. any other questions? To no, uh, we have, yeah, so note four, let me, uh, after all, define a vector that has been uh, defined before in your, uh, in your textbook, but uh, I always like to go step by step and uh, define things as they become necessary and clear. So I define the electric flux density D it is a vector that has been mentioned even in the beginning of uh, the chapter in the textbook. And uh, the definition I give in free space is epsilon naught times the electric field. So basically in free space, it's just off the electric field by this constant. Then Gauss's law says that Uh, that uh, this vector integrated over the surface just gives you the enclosed charge Q itself, no other constants. So you see this uh, has units of Coulomb per meter squared, and this has units meter squared, so uh, that uh, is integrated to Coulomb. So that is the electric flux density. Right now it's not very interesting, uh, admittedly. It's not very interesting uh, right now. It's simply... Uh, the electric field multiplied by a constant. So it's exactly the same vector. It will become more interesting when we go to dielectrics. So now I go to the main point about Gauss's law. Can it be used to calculate electric fields? So with Coulomb's law, with the expression for the electric field we found, we actually saw that we could find electric fields. We calculated electric fields in various situations. Can we use Gauss's law for calculation of the electric field? Uh, the answer is not in general. So Gauss's law is universally true. So this is not a statement on the validity of Gauss's law. but not always useful to calculate the electric field. When is it useful? It is useful only when you actually have symmetries that allow you to express the electric field in terms of one unknown constant or one unknown function that you can then determine from Gauss's law. I will explain what I mean in a bit, unless
one unknown function that can be determined by applying the law. So what does that mean? First of all, you see the difference. You can always solve this uh, differential equation and determine an electric field given the charge distribution, but that is not uh, the case for Gauss law in the integral form. And uh, by the way, I'm talking here about the integral form of Gauss's law, not the differential form. And I will explain exactly what I mean. Let's go back to this uh, line charge density. So here is the example, the first example. Line charge density. Remember what this was about. It was a power line example where we have along the z axis a, a charge density dq over dz. Okay. So I have a line charge density along the axis, constant. So what can we say about the electric field? With Gauss's law, you cannot start solving the problem. You have to first guess how the electric field looks like, approximately. What is the direction? What are the symmetries involved? So first of all, you remember that we argued that if you imagine this as an assembly of point charges, and you have an observation point here, no matter what point charge you pick, that will create an electric field like this. But I can always find, because this distribution is infinite, I can always find another point charge as an edge of, of an isosceles triangle that generates, so this triangle is isosceles, so that generates an equal magnitude electric field in this direction. So that's how we argued that the electric field will have to point in the radial direction. So if you add those up, you don't find any rho or z component. It has to be radial. And r hat is the unit vector of the cylindrical coordinate system. And I can say one more thing. OK, now we have this function, right? If we look at, if we express this function in terms of cylindrical coordinates, r phi z, and let me again remind you that uh, if I have here a point P in Cartesian coordinates, I project it on the xy plane. To P prime, so this is R, this is phi, what you called uh, probably in your math course uh, theta. And this still is Z. So this uh, third coordinate is the same as that of the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. So you see, f you verify by moving on a circle around the axis. But as we repeatedly argue, if you move on a circle around the charge, you won't see any difference in the charge. The, uh, this line uh, charge distribution is actually symmetric with respect to this phi variable. So I don't expect to have any dependence of the field on phi. Of course, now in retrospect, you know there won't be. But we could argue that in advance, that there, is no, there cannot be any dependence on phi. If I move around the charge distribution, I see no difference in the charge. There is no reason why I should see different fields that are caused by that charge. 
that makes no, would make no sense. If I see the same source, I should see the same effect. Well, you don't know if you are here, or you are here, or if you are here, as long as you have a fixed distance, you see exactly the same thing, a wire that generates a field. And likewise, if you have a drone that changes only its Z coordinate, just like the drone over the surface in the previous lecture, you won't see any change in this line charge because we have assumed it to be infinite, which engineeringly means that we are very far from the edges of this wire. So it is long enough and we stand far enough from the edges so that we don't see that this wire ends somewhere. So therefore, I don't expect to have any Z dependence either. So out of this physical inspection of the problem, I can guess that the electric field will have to be radially directed and depending only on R. And I want to bring your attention to the point that the dependence and the direction are two different things that need to be argued separately. So you see, I separately argued that the electric field is directed in the radial, radial direction and separately argued that it depends on R. You have a vector. Vectors have magnitude and they have direction. The dependencies on those have to be inspected and found uh, separately, independently from each other. So then I know that I have electric field lines that look like this. In other words, I have cylindrical symmetry in the problem. Uh, so guess what surface I will choose to apply Gauss's law? A cylinder. So, so you see now I have expressed my electric field in terms of this, right? Now, you see this depends only on R, and R is the distance from a z-axis. So if I apply Gauss's law on a cylinder of radius R, here is what I get. So this is my charge on the z-axis. This is the cylinder. Let's say that the cylinder starts at uh, z equal 0, it ends at z equal L, and has a radius R. So I get the cylinder by fixing my distance from the charge, from the wire, from the axis. And that means that on the cylinder, on the surface, the electric field will be perpendicular. And more importantly, constant. So R is fixed, this guy is fixed. So if I go and apply Gauss's law, the left-hand side will be, you see the electric field is ER, hat. Now, if you go to your aid sheet, you will see various surface elements for the uh, cylindrical coordinate system. The one you need to pick is the one that has an R hat in front of it, because otherwise you get zero in the dot product. So you pick the R. This is the surface element that points perpendicularly to the uh, surface of the cylinder, and that will be r d phi dz. 
So this is uh, formed on the surface of the cylinder. by this arc, so this is r, this is d phi, you have here this length r d phi, and then you have a dz, so this is the ds that we are using. If you put the ds's for phi and z, the dot product will give you zero, so these clearly are not useful here. R that R is equal to 1. You see the integration is with respect to phi and z. So phi varies from 0 to 2 pi. Z varies from 0 to L. Therefore, R being constant, it, can, it has to be taken out of the integral. And that is an indication that you are doing the right thing in Gauss's law. If you are stuck with difficult integrations, you are not applying the law on the right surface. The integration in Gauss's law has to become trivial. Like it has become trivial here, where now the electric field is out, this one is out, so I have R times ER <coughs> times this integral 0 to L phi from 0 to 2 pi d phi dz that will give you 2 pi from d phi and L, 2 pi L. So the left hand side is, let me continue over there. So the left hand side is ER of R. to pi L. So you see this is my one unknown. With uh, this uh, inside to the problem, we were able to reduce it to that one unknown. The left hand side is 1 over epsilon naught times enclosed charge. So how much charge do I enclose here? Any ideas? How much charge have I enclosed? Yes? So linear charge density times the length of the cylinder? That's right. Rho L times L. Rho L times L. So you see the L's cancel out. And we find what we saw before, that this unknown function will have to be this. Okay. So that's, uh, that's uh, how you apply Gauss's law. Uh, I want to leave you with a final note. I will post also a handout on Quarkus that this trick, this assumption here is good whenever you have a cylindrically symmetric charge. So this is true for all, for any volume or line or surface charge density that is a function only of the R coordinate. So if your uh, ser uh, charge density depends only on distance r, the r coordinate of cylindrical coordinate system, then this, you can start with this one and apply Gauss's law on a cylinder. So we will see more examples with other uh, charge distributions. You may say, well, I don't, I don't see this r here. Well, it is though because this is uh, not zero only at r equals zero and then it is uh, the charge distribution is zero for every other r. So it does depend on r as well. It's a trivial case but does depend on r. And so would a charge cable or a charge coaxial and so on. So this is uh, pretty uh, valid in all those cases. So thanks for your attention.